let me also relax a little. And tomorrow we are praying to invoke the power in God's word for fruitfulness. There is a regenerative ability in God's word. You see, when the word of God comes to you, there is something the word of God is supposed to do in your life. And that something is that the word of God is supposed to heal your body. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 to 22. He said, my son, keep my words. Let them not depart from your heart. They shall be healing to your bones and to all of your body. So the word of God is supposed to bring healing to your body when you receive it. But apart from just healing to your body, the word of God is supposed to transform and change your life. Your overall life is supposed to be changed whenever you receive the word of God. Nobody should keep hearing the word of God and remain the same. When you read Mark chapter 4, that's what we are going to read. And I'm going to preach very briefly and then we'll pray. When you read Mark chapter 4, our Lord Jesus Christ told a parable. And that is the parable of the sower. He said, And he began to teach by the seaside, and there were gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into the ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables. So some messages a pastor preaches is more important than others. He taught them many things by parables, but one of the most important parables he told, which was recorded by Mark, is the parable of the sower. He said, hear this, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass that as he had sown, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. And some fell on stony grounds, and it did not have much earth. So immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth in the earth. Immediately it sprang up, but because it had no depth in the earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no roots, it withered away. And some fell among tongues, and the tongues grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruits. But others fell on good grounds, and did yield fruits. That sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some hundred. He that, and he said to them, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Wow. There is something. I love the way Mark wrote the whole parable. He has certain important details that you may easily overlook if you don't take your time to read it very well. He said a sower went out to sow and some of the seeds fell by the wayside and immediately Immediately, the birds of the air came and devoured the seed. But some fell on stony grounds. Because it did not have much earth, it sprang up immediately. However, when the sun arose and scorched it, because it had no roots, it withered away. 
the, the second one is the most interesting part of the parable. Immediately the seeds fell into the ground. Because there isn't much work to do about it, it sprang up quickly. There was not much earth. He didn't have to borrow, or how do you call it? Well, yes, borrow into the soil because there wasn't much to dig. So it quickly sprang up. And I'm going to explain this one to you so that you get it. For instance, if as we are here now, if I ask a simple question, which one of you wants to do full-time ministry? It is very easy for you or you or you or you or you or you or all of you up to maybe Michelle. It is going to be very easy for you to immediately lift up your two hands and your two legs and say that I want to do full time. I want to do a missionary. I quite remember when many of you completed high school and you came. All of you had aspirations. So I want to be a pastor. I want to be a missionary. And the truth is, there wasn't much earth. It was very easy for the call to ministry to be answered. How many of you are following me? I've had so many people who answered the call to ministry. They, came, they said, oh, we want to do full time. And at the time they said they want to do full time, there was one gentleman who used to live with me. When he said he wanted to do full time, I told him, I said, oh, you can do full time if you want, but the first requirement is rent your own apartment and move out. If you are able to rent your own apartment and move out, bring your application and I'll consider you for full time. He never really understood that thing of rent your own apartment and move out. It's so easy for my son to just sit down and say, oh, I want to, when I grow up, I want to be this and be a pastor. It is not going to be easy for some people to answer the call to full time because they have started paying rent. They have started paying school fees for others. They have started paying bills. They are living life. They have mothers and fathers to take care of. So if you are calling them to leave everything and come to full-time ministry, there is a lot of calculation and consideration to make. It might take them longer to agree to do full-time. But once they are able to decide that I want to do full-time, they will be able to do full time. Listen, I'll tell you this. There are only few people who, like myself, answered the call to full time before we knew what life was all about. And we have still remained with full time up to today. And we are still moving on. When I answered the call to do ministry full time, I was a teenager. I didn't even know anything. And I answered the call to do ministry and do full time. But one thing is, I allowed myself to gain roots into the answering of the call. Are you following what I'm preaching? Yeah? But sometimes when we preach, people run off and just accept what you have said and say oh yeah we'll do it and they are saying oh yeah we'll do it because they don't even understand what they are signing up for they don't understand what they are signing up for at all as a counselor for instance sometimes when people say we want to marry and they come for and that's why I stopped premarital counseling when they come you just realize that both of them are two ignorant heads that are sitting before you. They don't even know what life is about, let alone to think about marriage. So I, I stopped doing it. 
Because it is very disheartening to sit, to have a 35 year old man sitting across your table and he's totally ignorant about what life is and he's 35. And an innocent young old woman, 32, has agreed to marry this ignorant head. And both of them are ignorantly walking in with something. They have no idea what it's all about. So a sower goes out to sow. And all of you should listen to this. I have been preaching for some time now. And sometimes I get very discouraged. When I find out that I have preached volumes of truth. To the same people. And sometimes... When they are taking decisions and acting, you wonder whether they have ever heard a line from the Bible. Tonight, let me tell you something. After Jesus told the parable, in Mark chapter 4, in verse 21, he spoke another parable, but I don't know who partitioned the Bible. But 21, 22, 23 are all part of the parable of the sower. He said, I want you to know that no man ignites a candle and put it under a bushel. If any man is igniting a candle, it is because the candle must create a certain effect in his environment. Every light we have in this building tonight is not just a light. Every light you find around is carefully positioned to create a certain effect. It, 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 some of these lights, it took us about eight hours to be able to determine where it should stand. To create what kind of effect we're looking for. Are you following what I'm preaching? So no man, as I'm preaching this word... I'm not preaching it because I don't have anything to do. I'm preaching this word and I'm expecting that there is a certain change your life must bring to make a certain impact in my environment. And for me, my environment is the church. So I'm spending time in preaching to you because there is a certain kind of regeneration or transformation I'm expecting in you to make you better at serving in this house. I'm not just speaking. Now, look at me. Everybody look at me. As I'm speaking, there is a change I expect in you. A change I expect in your mind. A change I expect in the way you think and behave. God does not just bring us messages. I, I, can you see us? God does not just bring us messages. Every message God gives us like this one is supposed to serve a certain purpose in our lives. I was very shocked that I was just trying to monitor what we are doing online. And I found out that a, one of the young, very young girls, who was in the morning service when I was talking about service, I think right after service took a selfie and posted it on Facebook, just to let me know that everything I said is rubbish to her. Just to let me know, because that's the way I feel by seeing it. And later on, you call me and say you need counseling. And if I wasn't a pastor, I shouldn't even mind you by giving you counseling. Because I just said it. And you step out of the building and you do exactly what pastor said. That this is not what it's about. Exactly what pastor said. So that young woman is like the roadside hearer. She heard it, but immediately she stepped out of the door. The bits of the air ate the message, so she didn't even remember. She didn't even remember. Am I speaking to someone? The word that is preached is meant to create a certain effect. 
He said that no man lights a candle and put it under a basket. If a man lights a candle, he wants it to create a certain effect in his environment. So the word of God must bring a certain change to our lives. Am I speaking to someone? And can you follow what I'm preaching? Now, this word must produce results in our lives. But there is a reason why the word of God does not change us. There is a reason why the word of God does not transform us. There's a reason. And our Lord Jesus Christ in the parable of the sewer gives us the reason. He said, number one, the first reason why the word of God does not heal us, does not change us, does not transform us, is because we don't believe it. It's because we don't believe it. The reason why you do directly opposite to what you were told, whenever you are alone and you think no one will find you out, is simply because you don't believe what you were told. You don't believe it. Because, listen, if I give you a bottle of juice to go give to the man who lives in the yellow house, and I told you, my son, this juice I've given you contains poison. If you drink, you will die. Just go straight and go and give it to the man in the yellow house. Do you think if you truly believe me, you will stop by the path and open it and say, ah, daddy, pa, how can this beautiful juice contain poison? You open and take a sip. Will you do that? If you truly do believe me, just because I told you this syrup contains poison. You will make sure it doesn't even touch your fingers, let alone come close to your lips. The reason why you do directly opposite to what you've been told is because you do not believe what we said at all. You don't believe it. You don't believe. You don't, you don't think that what we are saying is true. You think that we are just trying to control you. We are trying to steal your joy. That is why no matter how many things I have said about so many things, we will do directly the opposite when we step out of the building or when you live online, you're going to do exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. Because you don't believe what you were told. He said those who fell by the wayside are those who hear the word and are unable to believe because they misunderstand the word. They don't believe it. There is doubt in their minds. Unbelief is the first thing that fights your fruitfulness by the word. There is a second reason why lots of people don't profit by the word. And that thing is shallowness. We are shallow. We don't get deep. And we don't allow the word to get deep into us. We are shallow. I have come to find out, and this is one of the major problems of the charismatic Pentecostal movement. We have a vague idea of what God says, but we don't really know for sure what God said. So you find among us charismatics, many of us quote the Bible, but we quote it like the devil. We quote the Bible, but we quote it halfway. So we have quoted the Bible all right but it doesn't carry the kind of meaning the writer intended it to have. And that is very common among charismatic Pentecostals. From our prophets to our Bible teachers, we quote the scriptures, but we quote it like the devil would. We quote the part that is useful to, for the end we want to achieve and leave the part that could say no. 
That's how we read the scriptures. Many of us don't even read the Bible on its own pages. All we know about the Bible is what the pastor told us. That is why a lot of noble people have not believed among us. So we are very shallow in the word. We are shallow in the word. We are shallow. We don't know what the Bible is saying. We are so shallow and that has made us so gullible. Hallelujah. The third thing that can fight your fruitfulness is lust or your cravings. Even though you remember exactly what you were told from God's word, there is a stronger and a deep craving in your heart for the world so much that you cannot bring yourself to submit to the truth of God's word. Last, cravings, what I want, what he wants, what she wants, that deep desire for it. That's why the word of God doesn't work for us. So there is something the word of God is telling us very clearly, but there is something we also want very badly. There is something the word of God tells us very clearly, but there is something we want very badly. And because we want it very badly, what the word of God is saying doesn't really matter. Am I speaking to someone? The next reason why the word of God doesn't work for us is anxieties and the cares of life. Yes, I've heard you, Pastor. But what if... I've heard you, Pastor... But what if, what if I do this and this doesn't happen and that happens and what if 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 and that is why many of us have missed God's best for us. What if, what if, you just, you always want to know what if, what if, what if this, what if that, what if this, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, the cares, the anxieties. By the grace of God, we have been able to start this television thing. But if I was asking questions on what if, I, we would never have entered the homes. Would never have entered the homes. Because these are times when if you are investing into something that would not readily bring returns, you need to really think about it. Because Nanze is a I'll, I'll tell you this. I was in a discussion with Pastor George and I asked him a simple question. I asked him, I said, what jobs are there? I mean, like, what jobs? When all these young people complete school, what jobs are there for them? I mean, what are they going to do? Because I went to town and I found out that now, the only jobs available is buying and selling. It's the main thing. Everybody is selling something now. Everybody is selling something online. And I'm wondering who is buying whose. It's about sale. We were driving to town. I saw a lot of people. Somebody is selling this. They are selling that. Young people. So I just, as I said, so I just asked Israel, I said, is this what these young people are going to do for all their lives? Just trying to sell something in traffic. And I, I was just thinking. I said, wow. Because I've been thinking about it. Where are the jobs? Listen. There are cares, there are anxieties. And many of us can't obey God because of the anxieties. The pride of life. The reason why I can't obey God is the pride of life. What if I was carrying a Gucci bag? 
What if I was carrying this designer bag? What if I was wearing that designer shoe? What if I was wearing that designer blouse? The pride of life, the things I have. What if I had a, 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 a house in the prime areas in the city? Because of that, I cannot allow the word of God to operate in my life. Because I want the beautiful things that add a certain kind of color to life. And that's why the word can work for us. Another thing that steals the power in the word is the deceitfulness of riches. Sometimes you are deceived to think that if you got a little wealthier or richer, life is going to be better. Only for you to get a little richer and realize that it comes with other responsibilities and it doesn't really transform life that much. Deceitfulness of riches. Some people are rich and they are deceived to think that just because they have money, death is afraid of them. They are deceived to think that just because they have money, um, God is even afraid of them. They are deceived because when I hear them speaking, I feel that they are speaking too big. Too big. They, they are speaking as if they are really in charge. But they aren't. Again, I mean, the deceitfulness of riches will keep you from obeying God's word. There were things I thought if I got in life was going to transform my life. I got them, it didn't transform my life. The last thing which has been fighting the word is our impatience. We are not patient enough to allow the word of God to work in our lives. We are not patient enough. We are not patient enough. We are not patient at all for the word of God to work in our lives. There is one thing I want you to remember. I taught you in the morning. I taught you in the afternoon. The afternoon's message is very important. Temptation. Temptation. Temptation is very important. Temptation is very important. And this evening, this message I'm teaching you. Because listen, I've interacted with people. I have taught in this church for years. And sometimes I wonder, did they really understand? That is why I'm not shouting and I'm taking my time to speak. Because I realize that sometimes when we shout and you shout amen, when you shout amen, whatever you heard here, come out of your mouth as you shout. So maybe you should sit down quietly and just listen and ponder so that these words will settle in your heart and you can make a certain decision that I'm going to allow the word of God to work in my life. We are going to pray and tomorrow our focus for prayer is that the word of God will regenerate us. The word of God will transform us. The word of God will make us